-hmm. I've been challenging a lot of people who are in the learned community or the expert community that learners in, will inherit the earth now because so much information is ubiquitous that your ability to ask the better question really is adds more value than just being quick at, f at knowing the answer. And so what I did is uh, during the World Cup soccer, um, uh, we were all exposed to the amazing and or annoying sound of the Vuvuzela. And so one of the things that I found very interesting is that everybody kept talking about what a horrible sound that is. I mean, you hear it on your stereo. And even all these companies were trying to figure out ways. But then, you know, all of a sudden the cultural aspect came in. Well, that's what they're doing. That's the sound of it. They don't but they don't block out the sounds of singing in, in London, so why would they block out the Vuvuzela? So anyhow, I was interested with that challenge, and so one of the things I realized that, you know, as myself having a math and science background, eliminating this or reducing the sound of the Vuvuzela is a real math, real science question. And my immediately I realized that in the tradition, in a school context, you can't answer that question because it's not a real world circumstance. However, if I take the real world math, real world science, and then give it a real world math and real world science question, then that's how we can solve a problem. As opposed to, we learn the grammar of it in school, disconnected from the real world. So anyhow, to make a long story short, I, I, um, I used students that weren't necessarily um, um, good math students, and I challenged uh, uh, um, math experts um, on a, in a competition where they had an hour, an hour and a half, or two hours, depending on the different places where I've tried it, to take a clip that I had collected of the Vuvuzela from actually from the World Cup, and they had to reduce to as much as they can, reduce the sound of the Vuvuzela. And they had to go into their own groups, their own kind of rooms to do this. I knew that from the, and by the way, it was a test. I always tell teachers, can I make an, can I do an experiment with you? I didn't know if it was going to work. And so the very first thing that the kids that we do, we have this process that I show kids on how to ask good questions. And it's something that I start because that's where, again, the producer in me, that's what my job is to be the one that asks good questions. I don't have to know the answers, which I didn't, by the way, but starting. But one of the very first difficult questions that I ask with the kids um, that the adults didn't ask is, what is a Vuvuzela? Just that fundamental question. When we asked that, uh, and the kids went to Wikipedia first, whereas uh, the adults didn't go to Wikipedia because the experts felt that Wikipedia is is not the truth. You shouldn't go there, even if it's something as basic as a Vuvuzela. However, the students went there first, and it, sure enough, it said it's Vuvuzela, it's this measurement, it's this, and um, for the most part, it makes uh, uh, the sound of a, I think it was B flat. And um, it's in the lower B, B, B flat, and it shows you, uh, but I don't know what B flat is. So the kid says, what is a B flat? And they typed it in, and it gave you a frequency. I think it was like 466, or it was a range between 466 and 480-something. And so what I did is I had the students, once they figured that out, how, how do we know they got that number? And so one of the things we asked online is, how do you measure frequencies? Well, you need an oscilloscope. So, well, can we, where can we get an oscilloscope? When I went to the adults at this point, the adults said, you know, we can't get an oscilloscope because they're too expensive. Um, we, you know, obviously we're at a conference, we don't know how to get one. So all of these different, what I call analog excuses of why they couldn't do this experiment. In fact, you know, they were just chilling. You know, they weren't going to do this. Um, it's almost like they gave up because in their expert head, they didn't have their expert tools so that they could do their expert job. Where the kids had, learner questions, so they went and looked for learner resources for their learner questions. So then the question was, how do we use an oscilloscope? I don't know, let's figure it out. So again, we YouTubed it, and it showed you how to do it. So when we played it, held it next to the TV, we could see where it was uh, measuring the sound of the Vuvuzela. It was obvious how we were collecting it. From that information, we were able to download that graph that actually showed the two peak area, the two peak spots where the Vuvuzela and actually was those that were closer to the camera and those were further away from the camera. And all they did is they figured out how do we isolate that frequency? Question. The answer easy. I mean, by the way, these were simple questions. And so, like on Google, one of the first responses was 
you need parametric, a parametric equalizer. So where do I find a parametric equalizer? So kid, one of the things was in GarageBand, or I'm sorry, in Australia, GarageBand. And uh, they went to GarageBand, went to parametric equalizer, inputted the video, isolated and chose those two frequencies and just pulled it straight down because they didn't know how to do it. But they figured if it was going up, then maybe by going down, was going to reduce the sound of, the fre the, of that frequency. And sure enough, they played the before and after, and they can see that within an hour, they were able to solve a real problem. But, and we've done this like eight times, or, and, and other people have done it as well. They've never gotten a group of expert math adults to actually solve that problem. I did get a couple of engineers that solved it but they had already knew where I was going with it. And actually it was great to have engineers because they actually attested to the fact of doing math versus knowing math. Um, and so I use that example. Can I, by the way, I could do that with a lot of different things just to show teachers that we're living in a space where if you could teach kids to engage in the kind of questioning, you can get them to do a lot more than, than you be responsible for the questions. Because if you're responsible for the questions, then they're thinking the only way I can get an A is by getting inside your head. One thing I love about being a producer is everybody knows I'm an idiot. So which means that they are not going to ask me the question. So they know that we're co-learning together. Whereas a teacher, the assumption is you still know the answer. So how do we put yourself in a situation where let me ask a question where you don't know the answer, so we're co-learning. And I think that for co-learning, then there's a better chance that learning is going to happen. And to me, that's where the Vuvuzela story is, which by the way, we've gotten, we've actually added stuff. I mean, Joseph was showing me stuff, how we can figure out ways on that frequency, like what animals in the animal kingdom or insects can hear or not hear those frequencies. So I think it was like, if you were a beluga whale, you can watch the, the, the World Cup with a beluga whale, because. The beluga whale does not hear that frequency. But I didn't know. A lot of times it's kind of artificial. I mean, I'm, I, I'm sorry to say this, but a lot of times when I see the co-creation, it's like the teacher already knows the answer. Yeah. So there's a bit of condescension, condescendingness that I yeah. see happens. Um, I actually, as a producer, I have no idea of what it is that I'm um, trying to l learn. So, I mean, what it is that I'm trying to tell a story on. So you're seeing my learning. Yeah. And I think the other thing that's powerful is we saw the kids, through their questioning process, turning to technology. Absolutely. To actually find the answers. Yeah. Um, and to talk about those answers and be really creative with the technology rather than use it in a you know, really passive in, you know, linear way that we often do with kids. Yeah, because we don't, well, the thing is, is that technology in school is another noun. You were talking about nouns and verbs. Like, teachers will say, we're going to do an animation project, or we're going to do a blog project, or we're going to do an iMovie project. They're putting the emphasis on the tool and resource, the first thing. Where if you cook, no one says, we're going to be doing a knife uh uh, we're going to be doing a knifing dinner, or we're going to be doing a whisking bread. No one puts the emphasis because cooking schools or chefs recognize that the technology is the verb necessary to add value to the noun. Tomato, cut it, salad. So the technology is critical to reach the goal. You cannot make a salad without... <laughs> Uh, the knife in the middle. Think about in schools. Think about your curriculum. This is one thing you and I were talking about. One of the challenges that I face, you can edit this part out. If I looked at your goal or your curriculum, and then we take a look at what is expected of the kid, you could actually do it without the need of technology. So the question is a problem because what it says is we have to force fit or creatively figure out how to use technology to help address this question. My question is, if you asked a better question, then you have to use technology. Like, if I'm gonna do a tomato here, right, if draw a tomato, and then obviously I, you have to cut it to make a salad, what do I need? The kids will come up, what are the tools I need to make a salad? We and, don't do that. And you talked about the verb is cut. And yeah. then you talk about the adverb and, yeah. you know, how well it's cut. That's and, right. And, and that's what can add value to it. And I think that's what we, what we often don't look at is 
looking at those adverbs. No, we don't. We don't. We don't look at anything. We don't. And that's what's important about the story because you actually can look at like the, the the adverbs. You can look at the uh, the the adjectives, and you can take a look at how critical that is to help tell that story. Because when you work with kids, you know, Gina went to the store. Well, how was Gina? Happily, Gina went to the store. Really happily, Gina went sad, sadly walking to the yeah. store. Said it's those other ingredients that help c communicate that story yeah. that are going to make it more. Because because what you're doing to language is you're visualizing it, yeah. okay. and the more you visualize it, the more you make connections. The more you make connections, the more neural connections are made. The more neural connections are made, then it's more it's going into long term memory. So that's why it's important about telling story versus report. Yeah. That's why no one remembers reporting. Everybody remembers story a lot more because there were different connections that were being made. So I think the challenge for us as educators right now, especially with all the technology, is how do you make it so the technology is like a no-brainer? Of course I, I need, if I'm going to bake a cake, where the heck is the mixing bowl? Um, well, that's next week. We don't talk about mixing bowls yet. We're still on whisks this week. Well, then I cannot bake a cake until most kids can do all their assignments without. Most assignments that I've seen, you can still do without technology. So teachers, ask a question that, like my question to Vuvuzela, you can't answer without technology. There's no way.